I'm actually um, really excited to uh, have our next speaker here with us. A couple of us on the team have heard her speak before. Um, she talks a lot about the brain first lens for behavior. So she is coming here uh, today to, to talk to us about, about how she sees behavior and how she thinks about it, hopefully to give us some more insight into the behaviors that we're, that we're dealing with. So Eileen Devine, thank you so much for being here. She is thank an LCSW you. and she is gonna introduce herself far more better than I can, but um, go ahead and get us started. She's uh, got an hour here to take us through this. And as long as you're all good, can you hear, can you see? I can see and hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Eileen, Great. take it away. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. And I want to begin by wishing any dads out there a very happy Father's Day. Um, I wish I could be with you in person, but I've got a special dad here <laughs> that I needed to be home so that he could celebrate his day in the way that he wanted to. So I am a licensed clinical social worker. I live in Oregon. I work with parents who have kids whose brains work differently for one reason or another, lots of different reasons it could be working differently. And all of them have very similar challenging behavioral symptoms. And so I don't work with the kids. I don't work with the family unit. I only work in supporting the parents, taking care of their nervous system and health, and also helping them see their child through this brain first lens, which we're going to talk about today. And I was so glad to be able to catch the end of Angela's presentation as I waited there in the waiting room to get started, because I think you'll hear a lot of very similar um, themes, ideas, and overlaps from what she was talking about. So hopefully this will just help even build additional layers in terms of your understanding. The other piece that I would... Um, that I want to mention is that I am also the parent of a 13 year old who has significant neurobehavioral challenges. She has a brain that works very, very differently. Um, oftentimes, uh, pretty challenging behavioral symptoms. Um, she's 13. And I was doing clinical social work long before I was a parent. But when I started parenting her, understanding that she had this difference, I had a diagnosis, but it didn't translate into parenting for me. The the very good traditional parenting techniques that I was using for my neurotypical son, which were working beautifully, <laughs> were not working for her. And it was actually making her symptoms, her behavioral symptoms worse. So that led me on this journey to figure out how to parent her in a way that helped her settle to experience less challenging behavioral symptoms. And so then I decided, well, doesn't sound like enough people are talking about this with parents. And so I wanted to be that person, and that's how I um, came to supporting parents today. So let's get started. Um, so it's a brain thing. We know, based on neuroscience research, that the brain is connected to behaviors for each and every one of us, every human being walking this, this earth. The two can never be separated, okay? So it just makes sense, then, that if somebody's brain works differently for some reason, that we will see behaviors that tell us that, that communicate that to us, okay? Um, so when we think about what our brain does for us every day, I don't know about you, but before I started parenting a child who has, again, significant neurobehavioral challenges, significant intellectual and developmental disabilities, I did not think at all about what my brain does for me every day. It was a luxury and a privilege that I had that I didn't even realize I had. When I started parenting her and understanding this connection, the brain is always connected to behaviors. That's when I thought, oh my goodness, our brain does everything for us every single day. Even that transition from sleep to wake is a brain thing, right? Um, and no wonder she struggles so much. No wonder if her brain has been impacted and works so differently. No wonder all of these seemingly easy tasks that I do, that her peers do, that her, again, her older brother, who's only 15 months older than her, but is what society would consider neurotypical. No wonder it's so easy for them and for me and for him, but not for her, right? And that's when the pieces really started to come together. But in order to understand that connection, that brain first lens and how our child looks through that brain first lens, we have to understand how their unique brain function works, okay? So we are in our next hour, we're gonna try to hit all of these. We're gonna talk about what if the brain is the source of all behaviors, what does that mean for kids who struggle behaviorally? 
What does it mean for the, pay, the way that we parent them, we support them and teach them? How does it then look different for them? What about all those different diagnoses that our kids have received, like ADHD and sensory processing disorder and ODD and lots and lots, I could go on and on and on. The brain is the organizing principle around all of that, right? So understanding what that's telling us about how our child's brain works, that, that particular diagnosis. Why do very good parenting techniques fail miserably with my child? If things like consequences don't work, what does work? I remember when my mentor who created this neurobehavioral model that we'll be talking about today, Diane Malvin, when she told me, you have to just kind of let go of consequences for her. They're not going to work. They're a waste of your precious energy. And I thought, how do you parent then? <laughs> If you can't rely on consequences, what do you do, right? But there's reasons, again, based in neuroscience research, why our child's brain works differently and then why consequences don't work for them. So what do we do differently? What if we started from the standpoint that all of our kids would be doing well if they could? Every time that we're met with a challenging episode with them, it's like, ah, oh, they would be doing better in this moment if they could. And there's some reason why they can't. How would this change what we did next, our approach and our support of them? And what if I didn't focus on changing their behaviors at all? Those challenging behavioral symptoms, and again, you'll hear me keep calling them symptoms. If we didn't even try to extinguish those, which is a behavioral lens, going after the behavior, doing everything in our power just to make it stop. What if instead we focused on how does this connect to their brain? What's happening between their environment, the way their brain works, where that, where is that rub? Where we're and now we're seeing these challenging behavioral symptoms. What would change in terms of our everyday interactions and approach with them? So the neurobehavioral model is what helps us understand our child from a brain first lens. So today, obviously, we have an hour, less than an hour now. And so I'm going to give you a quick overview of this foundation. So it's it's really to, to start having you think from this perspective, get you curious, kind of dipping your toes in it, right? And then I know that there's some other ways for you to learn more about this, which I'm sure you'll hear about after we're done if you haven't already, okay? So this is the overview of that neurobehavioral model that helps us see our child through this brain-first lens versus that behavioral lens that society is so entrenched in, including ourselves, right? It's the way we were raised. It's the way we've always viewed behaviors. I'm making broad generalizations here, but most people in my, in my experience. The first thing to understand about this model is that it is an individualized approach based on your unique child's brain function. I've worked with lots and lots of parents who have gone through lots of um, therapies, protocols, worked with providers who have a very scripted kind of um, treatment for their child, right? Whether it's behaviorally based or, or what, what have you. And oftentimes what happens is they describe the behavior, that practitioner or whoever it might be gives them a list of strategies to try. They go home and try them. Maybe a few work, but then they don't, right? After a few weeks, maybe none of them work. Um, and it usually leaves those parents feeling like feeling frustrated, like nothing works. Oh, here's another thing. Doesn't work for my child. It works for all these other kids. Nothing works for my child, right? And there's reasons why that is the case, because those scripted kind of treatments don't consider every child's unique brain function. Same diagnosis, same age, different brains, right? They're going to be lagging behind in different skills. So this approach has parents look at their child, how their child's brain works um, in comparison to every other child out there, right? Again, even ch children with the same, same diagnosis, there's going to be overlap, of course, in where those areas of struggle are, but that child is still unique and it's important to understand that. What this also means then for all of you as parents is that there is a steep learning curve in the beginning. It does level out right? And it's worth the time and the energy. But oftentimes parents will say, can't you just tell me what to do? And it's like, I, I get it. I understand why you think that would be the best way forward here because you're in chaos. There's tension. There's a lot of stress at home. But believe me when I say that this is the best way to get to that end result, which is helping your child calm down their challenging behaviors. 
So what does the um, brain have to do with our child's challenging behaviors anyways? Well, everything, right? That's the neuroscience research part that's brains are connected to behaviors. We see that difference in brain function and structure based on illness, genetics, prenatal substance exposure, trauma, pre and postnatal. There's lots and lots of different reasons why we see that reflected through behavioral symptoms, okay? That's our indication that something is um, different with this child's brain and the way that it works. When we can start to understand that, that this challenging behavior is actually a symptom of the brain working differently, and what that means is that we as parents need to accommodate and provide support rather than reaching for our power, trying to extinguish that behavior in any way that we possibly can think of, when that happens, we then have understanding and clarity like, oh, that's why my child is doing this really aggravating, challenging behavior, what it feels like all the time. I see the patterns. I see why that's happening. It also reduces our frustration and theirs, <laughs> and it improves outcomes. So I've said this already a few times, different source of brain differences similar symptoms. There's lots of different reasons why we get diagnoses that help us understand the reasons behind that, but the brain is the organizing principle. If you know that you have a child whose brain works differently, then that's all you need to know to begin parenting from this um, parenting from this perspective. Most of the parents that I work with, their kids have long lists of diagnoses. We go through those and we say, okay, what does this teach us about the way that your child's brain works, right? Because it can be very overwhelming to them. Like, oh my gosh, they have all these diagnoses. Yeah, it's okay. It gives us information on what somebody observed about your child, what you reported or um, what the provider saw. And so it helps us understand like, okay, this is why this is more information to help us fill out that picture of how my child's brain works differently. So the logic behind this model is fairly simple and straightforward. If the brain has been changed in function and structure for some reason, and if the brain is a physical part of our body, which it of course is, then we can um, think of our child as having a physical disability. And so what do we do for kids, for any individual who has a physical disability of any kind? We provide them with accommodations. Accommodations, not only do they work, that is the treatment for challenging behaviors, but there, it's also what's right and what's just and what's fair. Just because we don't think about our brain in the way that we would think about, for example, a child who had a physical disability of the lower extremities and maybe was bound to a wheelchair, we would never think twice about whether or not to give that child accommodations. Of course we would. If they could do it, they would, right? Same is true for our kids who have physical disabilities of the brain. What gets tricky, and I don't need to tell any of you this because you live it every day, is that we can forget, <laughs> right? We can forget. Even when we're clear on our child's diagnosis, we know it's significant, right? Um, there's all of these uh, ways that that's reflected back to us day to day. We can still forget that that challenging behavior is a symptom, of that brain-based disability. And instead of punishing, like, ooh, they're doing it on purpose to me all day long, we want to take a step back and say, oh, okay, they would be doing better if they could. How do I understand what accommodation is needed to help calm down this challenging behavioral symptom? So again, lots of different reasons why a brain can be changed in function and structure lots of challenging behavioral symptoms that result, all of them unique to each child, but lots and lots of overlap. So when I, when I help a parent to understand that, that foundational understanding, the next um, thought that they usually have or the next conversation is, well, that resonates with me. I get that. I want to know more about it, but oh my goodness, if the brain does everything for us all day long, even me with my hands, <laughs> like this, something is happening with my brain that is causing me to do this, right? To gesture. Everything that I'm talking about, you listening to me and trying to make sense of how does this apply to my child or not? What do I agree with? What don't I agree with? Oh, that resonates with me. Uh, I'm not sure about that, right? All of that is our brain working for us every single day, all day long. That can be quite overwhelming. How do I start to understand then 
what that means for my unique child and where all these challenging behavioral symptoms are coming from. So in order to help us organize our thoughts around this, we divide behaviors as a whole into two categories, okay? And again, it's just to help us kind of make sense and get clarity. The first is primary characteristics, and those are behaviors that help us gain insight into the way in which a brain works or works differently. So it includes things like executive functioning, processing pace, learning and memory, sensory integration. You know, some of the things that I heard Angela talking about at the end, at least what I caught, the end of her presentation. So when we look at what our brain does for us every day, the assumptions that we make about people because we just automatically think that everyone is kind of in that same place on that neurodiversity spectrum, we miss those primary characteristics or cognitive skills, brain tasks that they may be lagging behind in because of the way that their brain has been changed in function structure. These are some of the assumptions that we make, okay? So we make the assumption that people can think fast and lift, listen fast. And I, this is when I always remember that I've made that assumption. I've made that assumption about all of you that as I'm talking, hopefully I'm not talking too quickly, but that you can keep up with the rate at which I'm talking, you can think about it. You can, again, apply it to your own life or your own child, decide whether you agree with it or not, or what resonates or what doesn't, right? We know that individuals whose brains work differently are 10 second kids in a one second world. It's almost universal for all these kids. They process, especially verbal information, very, very slowly, right? So that's the accommodation. Ah, giving more time. We rarely give these kids the time that they need to do everything from listening to their name being called so that they turn their hand and acknowledge us um, to, you know, things like um, moving through their morning routine, very simple things that we expect them to be able to do. Predicting and planning ahead. We expect that at a certain age, kids can start to predict very obvious outcomes and plan ahead to either do that thing or not do that thing. So A plus B equals this really terrible, awful C. And why would anyone ever do that? <laughs> right? What were you thinking? Right? That kind of thing. Well, maybe they weren't because they didn't have the skills. They don't have the skills to do that A plus B equals C. Oop, so I better not do that. Better not do A plus B, right? Because that's a really bad outcome. What if that is a lagging skill for your child, then what do you need to do differently for a child of that age where you would expect them to have that skill in place? Multitasking and prioritizing. We expect at a certain age that kids can start to do two steps in a row, two directions in a row, certainly three, four, and five at older ages. What if you have an 11, a 12, or like my daughter, a 13-year-old, who can do one step at a time. The way I describe my daughter is that she's a very good listener. She wants to do the right thing, but she processes slowly, that first one, and she can only do one thing at a time. That's how I describe her to teachers, to grandparents, to coaches, <laughs> whoever else she might come into contact with, right? She's a really great listener. She wants to do the right thing, but you have to give her time, and she can only do one thing at a time right? Really, really different than she never listens. She never follows directions, right? Behavioral lens versus brain first lens. Learning and remembering and applying information, that's life, right? That's definitely school. What if we have a child whose brain works so differently that it takes them a very, very long time to simply get down and master the even more, most basic skills, what is the accommodation? For me, as a parent, that accommodation is accepting the need to reteach a million and one times. <laughs> that thing that I never thought I'd still be working on with a 13-year-old, right? That's an accommodation. Inhibiting impulses. We know that kids around the age of five or so start to inhibit their impulses. What if you have a 12, a 13, a 17, an 18-year-old? who cannot inhibit their impulses. What does that mean for the supervision we give them, for the accommodations that we provide really to keep them safe and those around them safe? We expect at a certain age that kids will start to be able to filter out 
and manage sensory input. What if you have a child who cannot help but to listen, hear, see, smell, everything in their environment all at once? They are not able to filter. What challenging behavioral symptoms do you see as a result of that overwhelm? their sensory system becoming overwhelmed, right? What accommodations do you provide them if that is the case? And then being able to identify and solve problems. So in order to identify and solve a problem, you have to first realize that there is a problem to be solved. <laughs> that is harder than it sounds, right? It's something we assume, especially as now adults, like, oh, that's a problem. We need to solve it, right? We need to take care of that. What if? We have a child whose brains work so differently that even at, say, teenage years, they don't even know that there is a problem to be solved. And we're pulling our hair out, right? How could they not know that this was an issue, a problem? Once we identify the problem, then we have to be able to brainstorm very abstract skill uh, um, uh, solutions to that problem and follow each one of those out, hold them in juxtaposition to each other and figure out which one works best which one is in my best interest or which one's going to solve this problem. We do this automatically all day long, right? That's about being an adult. <laughs> they say adulting. We have to be doing that all day long, simple and bigger problems. Very complex, very complex cognitive skills. No wonder our kids, even at young adult, teenage and young adult years, cannot do that independently. When we think about primary characteristics, again, the reflection of how our child's brain works differently, their lagging cognitive skills, the brain tasks that they have trouble with all day long, day in and day out, that can be quite a hefty load to carry as a parent too. And so to make, again, even more sense of it, to organize our thoughts around it, we divide it into these nine categories. And these are just brain task categories, again, to help us understand um, the bigger brain task categories and then what kind of details fall underneath. We don't have time today in this hour presentation to go through all of these in detail, but I am going to spend time in a few because to me, they're foundational to understanding our kids. Um, we've talked a little bit about sensory processing and integration. I'm going to talk about dysmaturity. That's why I skipped it. Nutrition. This is about being able to experience hunger cues. What if your child's digestive system and those cues is not connected to their brain in the way we would expect it because their brain works differently? They need to be prompted to eat more often. If they don't, they melt down. You have a 10-year-old, 11, 12-year-old melting down just like a toddler would if they missed their snack because we don't expect them necessarily to say, oh, I'm hungry, I'm getting kind of hangry, please feed me, right? We feed them on a schedule that we know they need so that they don't melt down, right? What if you have a much, much older child that still doesn't have that connection there? Or the opposite may be true, where your child eats and eats and eats and eats, they cannot feel that sensation of fullness, so they may eat until they're sick, right? What does that mean for accommoda accommodations? They may need to eat more frequently because of that brain fatigue. We'll talk about that in a minute. Language and communication, being able to talk better than they understand. Their expressive language may be, not in all cases, better than their receptive language, the way they receive information. They don't understand the context unless it's explicitly stated. They can talk the talk, but can't walk the walk, right? Lots, very common for a lot of these kids. They may talk in circles, talk, 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 and never get to a point, <laughs> right? Again, what does that mean for us as parents? Understanding that as a symptom of their brain working differently versus, oh my goodness, I asked you to be quiet already. We've been listening to that for two hours, right? <laughs> um, learning and memory, we talked a bit about that. Um, the big thing about learning and memory that I want to mention as well is having on and off days, absolutely foundational to understanding kids with brain-based differences of any kind. There may be a day where they can do it and we're like, yay, we've been working on this. They get it, whatever, whatever it might be, their morning routine, um, being able to transition somewhere that's more difficult for them usually, whatever it might be. And then the next day or the next week, they can't do it to save their life right? It doesn't mean those skills are lost. It means they're having an off day. There could be lots of reasons why. What's an accommodation? 
An accommodation for that is parents settling into the acceptance that your child is going to have on and off days. And that when you see them having an off day, that you assume it's about brain function, even if you're not quite sure what it is exactly about in relation to brain function, you assume it's about brain function and their differences, their disability, and you provide greater accommodations that day versus, I know you can do this. You did it yesterday. Oh, don't tell me you can't do it today. Okay, we're going to sit here till you do it, right? And things escalate and, right? What if? What if it's about their brain function? What would we do differently? Abstract thinking, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, feeling empathetic, understanding that people have their own thoughts and feelings, and that your actions actually impact people outside of your own being, right? Kids at a very, very young age, they don't understand that. They're very self-focused. Doesn't make us anxious though. We're like, oh, that's three, right? That's why being a parenting a three-year-old or even a four-year-old is so difficult, right? We're like, hey, 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 that's not okay. Let's do a redo. How did that make your friend feel? We help, we coach them through that process. Typically when kids start to get older, again, 10, 11, teenage years, even young adulthood sometimes, and they don't have those skills down, we see it as character. Oh my goodness, they are not capable of empathy, right? I've had parents say that to me numerous times. What a devastating thought as a parent, right? And I get it because that's what it looks like behaviorally. What if we take a step back, we consider what brain tasks and skills are involved? It's like, oh, okay, this is really actually very complex, a lot of abstract thinking skills. Maybe this is about brain, right? About skill, not about will. Then executive functioning, we'll talk about that a little bit more detail here in a moment too. So that primary characteristic, dismaturity, that was the first one on the list on the last slide. And I said, I wanted to um, dive into it a little bit more deeply because in my experience, this is universal for kids who have brain differences of any kind, no matter the diagnoses. And I've never worked with a family where this hasn't been one of the primary characteristics that their child struggles with. It is not uncommon for, well, let me talk about what it is here on the slide here. Dismaturity is the gap between a child's chronological and social emotional age, their developmental age. And so we talk about immaturity, like stop acting so immature. Immaturity implies that a child can do something differently and they're choosing not to. That's not what this is. Your child is a different age, developmentally, socially, emotionally. So how would you support a child of that age? How would you teach this particular skill or explain this particular idea to a child of that age, right? When, um, when I'm working with parents and we talk about dismaturity, I let them know that it is not uncommon for kids who experience dismaturity to be about half their chronological age in many, many ways. Okay, So taking their chronological age, dividing it in half is a very good starting point for many parents. Um, don't get too stuck on what age is it. That's not important. And it might vary. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, The important thing is to keep it in mind. It's an accommodation to keep this in mind, right? And when you don't know what else to do, taking that step back and saying, what age does this remind me of? It can help de-escalate us. It can help us instantly put this into a behavior first lens versus staying entrenched in a behavioral lens and can help us understand what we might do differently based on that child's actual age, right? Not chronological age. What age are they? Are they really? This is where it can get tricky, right? Is sometimes it is an uneven development. So this is an example with a 13 year old. If you have a child who is 13, socially and emotionally, there may be that of a seven year old. So think about the complexities of a 13. I mean, I have a 13 and 14 year old. So I'm in the midst of it (laughs) with all the middle school, teenage complexities, the social things going on, all of that. It gets very complex and tricky, right? Um, If they are half their age, socially, emotionally, that of a seven year old. So like a first grader, first grader, versus seventh grader, we already can see the poor fit, right? No wonder 
they have so much difficulty with peers, right? They don't have the skills that we would expect of their chronological age. All of our kids have strengths. So say that your child, well, let's use an example, a sports metaphor. So let's say we have a 13 year old, they're very skilled at a particular sport. Um, and the coach is saying like, wow, that child's really talented. I really want to have them on my team. Wonderful. Their expressive language, this child's expressive language is that of a 13 year old. So they can talk the talk. They sound like they know what's going on, but their receptive language, the way they understand the coach's instructions, that what the team is talking about, the unspoken context of that conversation or that situation is that of an eight, eight year old. So more like a second grader, right? A first or second grader. So already you can start to see where problems, where there might be a poor fit so that challenging behaviors emerge. You have a, say the coach doesn't understand any of what we're talking about. They have a 14 year old who's very skilled, can talk the talk, but can't walk the walk, but they don't see it through a brain first lens. They see it through a behavioral lens. So that child is what? That child is always acting silly. They're never following directions. They're kind of poking at their teammates, right? Like a very young child would. So then they get benched during practice. Then they get kicked out of practice. Then they get kicked off the team, right? It just escalates from there because nobody is understanding that those challenging behaviors are actually about their lagging skills and providing accommodations, right? And then executive functioning skills, that's what EF stands for there. That's about planning, being able to transition. We're gonna talk a lot about executive functioning here in a moment, that of a six-year-old. So more like a young first grader, older kindergartner, right? So again, the goal is not to um, say, what age is my child then if they're this age? Because it's going to look different depending on the environment, depending on the situation. Um, my suggestion to you would to be not ca get caught up in that, but to start to observe, start to be on the lookout for dismaturity and how it plays into your child's experience of their world. And to say, what age does this remind me of, right? If you have neurotypical children, what society would consider neurotypical children, that can be a good gauge. If they have cousins, right, neighborhood kids, that can kind of be a good, get, good gauge for us too. The, you know, the last thing that I'll say about dysmaturity before I move on is this is the other piece that um, I'm guessing this will resonate with many of you that when parents start to understand this and see it clearly, they're like, oh my goodness, like, wow my 18 year old is really like a 10 or 11 year old in almost every way. No wonder they won't take responsibility in the way that I've been pushing for them to do as an 18 year old. Right. Or maybe I knew that they weren't as mature as their peers, but I thought maybe 16 or 15, when you start to really observe, you see just how young they might be. And for us as parents, there's a lot of emotions that come up for that. Right. We're not going to talk today about the parent experience, but it's 50% of what I talk to parents about. And this is a big piece of it in terms of settling into acceptance, understanding that this is who my child is. And what does it mean for me as her mom that she's 13, in my case, 13 going on six or seven, right? What does it mean for how she will be an adult in this world and what support she might need? What does that mean for me as an adult? <laughs> in my retired life, right? All of those kinds of things, really normal for that to bubble up to the surface. So paying attention to that for yourself and getting support where you need that. All right, so that other primary characteristic that I didn't go over quickly there because I wanted to spend more time on it was executive functioning. And again, the reason why I'm spending time here, just like dismaturity, I've never worked with a parent or a um, parenting partnership where executive functioning wasn't a place of um, significant lagging skills for their child. Looks different for each one, but most kids lag behind in several, if not all of these. So what does it look like? It's things like difficulty transitioning or shifting gears. We know what transitions look like, and usually we're like, yep, my child has difficulty transitioning. That's usually not a surprise to parents. But two things that I wanna mention with that that sometimes get missed, the transition from sleep to wake and wake to sleep, those are transitions that our brain day it does for us. No wonder so many of our kids have sleep disturbances. And then shifting gears cognitively. So this thing that we were looking forward to, 
that we all thought was going to happen tomorrow didn't happen because the car wouldn't start, because a thunderstorm rolled in, we couldn't be outside, because COVID, right? All of those sorts of things. Nobody's fault. Everybody's disappointed. But maybe your neurotypical children, they say, oh, that stings. Oh, I'm so disappointed, man, right? They kind of regulate through that. Maybe your child with brain differences, explosion, and you're recovering the rest of the day. They cannot shift those cognitive gears from anticipation and excitement to disappointment. Upset by um, changes in tasks, schedules, routine. I had a parent that I worked with who they had to rearrange the furniture in their living room because of getting ready for work. Work was being done on their house. And their daughter returned home from school and completely came unglued. She could not handle the visual change of the layout of the living room. They didn't even think about it. I'm not sure I would have thought about it in helping them anticipate that, right? Um, impulsive behaviors, we talked about that. Difficulty getting, in, getting started, so initiating tasks, initiating activities, or staying engaged in the task, especially non-preferred activities, right? Again, this is, this is the same for all of us. For us to be able to initiate a non-preferred activity or stay engaged in a non-preferred activity, it takes more brain fuel for us. It takes more motivation. When you think about motivation, think of skills. It's a skill. It's not a character flaw or um, trait. So it's the same for all of us. We just have brains that work typically. So we say, oh, okay, it's got to be done. Let's go get it done. Okay, let's go, go, go do it, right? What if you have a child whose brain works so differently that they have a difficult time initiating activity to begin with, especially non-preferred activities. Difficulty staying engaged or finishing a task, unable to link past experiences to the current situation. This is why consequences do not work very well or at all with our kids. We say, if you do this again, this is what's gonna happen. Maybe sometime, it could be later that day, right? Because of learning and memory, it could be later that day they've already forgotten. Certainly the next day or the next week, they do it and we say, oh, there you go again. Okay, now this is taken away or you can't go do this or whatever it might be. What that does is it backs us up into a corner because <laughs> because it's not working, because our kids don't, they don't have the ability to hold on to that threat of a consequence, bring it to the present moment, inhibit their impulses long enough to say, oh, I better not do this because mom and dad warned me. <laughs> if I do this, this is what's going to happen. None of that is happening for them because of their lagging skills. But we continue to give them consequences and the stakes get higher and higher and higher. Pretty soon we're backed into a corner. It's like, well, what else can I take away from them? <laughs> you know, I've tried everything. What else can I bribe them with? Right? Might work for a few, few weeks, like I said, and then it doesn't work. Why is that? Right? Executive functioning can look like difficulty identifying goals, planning steps to reach them. Those are uh, much older executive functioning skills that we expect, you know, again, middle schoolers to be working on teenagers, young adults. Getting stuck in behavioral loops or verbal loops or perseveration, right? We don't know. We don't care about Bruno. <laughs> I heard that little piece before I came on. This is what I thought of, getting stuck in those loops. Or they're like picking, 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 picking at their sibling or their, their pet, right? It's like, you've got to stop doing that. I've told you a million times. What if they are stuck right? What if they are stuck? There was a time with my own daughter, this was many years ago, I'd say she's probably about 10 or so, where she was running around the first floor of our house. And the first floor of our house is kind of this oval shape with the doorways and the way they connect. And she was shoving our dog as she ran by. A dog's like 100 pounds. He was totally unfazed by it. But she was also shoving her brother, who was more annoyed than anything. And she had this like cackle, which is that silliness and that kind of cackle laughter is a clear sign of dysregulation, right? Our child's nervous system is completely unstable. I did not see it like that at the moment because I was caught up in my own reactive <laughs> Um, reaction to this really aggravating behavior. And so I'm yelling from her in the corner saying, you need to stop. You need to stop. Maya, stop, stop. Right. And it's just getting more and more. She's getting more and more dysregulated and agitated. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my goodness, I can see it. She's stuck in this behavioral loop. Like I can literally see her running in this loop that she's stuck in. So I got in her way. She ran right into me. 
she was not even in her thinking brain, right? She looked at me like deers in a headlight. And I said, do you want to go take a bath? Because she loves taking baths. And she was like, yeah. So we're walking up the stairs. And the whole time I'm telling myself, you're not giving in to bad behavior. Let it go. This is an accommodation. She was stuck, right? So here I do this for a living. (laughs) And I talk to parents about this all the time. And even in my own personal moment, I had to talk myself through that, right? She gets into the bath. I'm like sitting in my room, just kind of taking a deep breath. She asked me to come in. I come back in and she's like, I'm sorry. I don't even know why I was doing that, which is huge for her to be able to sit, reflect, apologize, understand that she truly didn't know what she was doing, right? She was totally stuck in that behavioral loop. And if I didn't help her get unstuck, I don't know what it would have escalated to, (laughs) right? Um, So that's just one of many, many examples. Cognitively rigid, so can't let go in an argument, um, not being able to um, see another point of view, can't see what's coming next, difficulty tolerating frustration. That's what this looks like. So our children with brain differences have a very narrow window of tolerance. So the slightest agitation, the slightest frustration, the slightest expectation of them that makes it so that they can't um, you know, comply or do what they're told because of their lagging skills, boom, right? They're out of their thinking brain. And we're spending all this time recovering, helping them come back into their thinking brain. So when they're out of their thinking brain, even the skills, the skills are already difficult in terms of listening, being reasonable, sit down, sit still. We're going to talk about this. On a good day, those are difficult for our kids. If they're out of their thinking brain, it is a waste of your precious energy to try to get them to do those things. So the best thing that you can do is help them regulate. We're not going to get into that today. That looks different for every child, but it usually means using less words, being present, being regulated yourself, right? Um, A dysregulated adult cannot provide regulation for a child. So again, all of that outside of the moment care, nervous system health stuff that we need to do for ourselves so we can help them come back into their thinking brain and settle again. Our kids do have the ability to widen their window of tolerance over time, right? But if we are having expectations placed on them that are not in line with their cognitive skills, they're going to be out of their window of tolerance much of the time, and they cannot grow. They cannot learn. None of us could, right? If we were out of our thinking brain, completely overwhelmed, anxious, um, we couldn't learn either. Same is true for our kids. They just spend so much more of their time out of their thinking brain because they're so misunderstood, right? And they're so fragile. Dr. Ross Green, he's the author of Collaborative Problem Solving. He says, when children exhibit challenging behaviors, it's because the demands being placed upon them outstrip the skills they have to respond adaptively to those demands. The same can be said of all human beings. It's not unique to our kids. What's unique to our kids is the intensity and the frequency by which they experience this because their brain works so differently and because their skills are so lagging behind. And that's why we see challenging behaviors, okay? So we have lagging skills, lagging cognitive skills. Because their brain works differently, their brain has been impacted in function and structure. They are in environments where the expectations are not in line with their cognitive skills. Their their differences may be, um, maybe not all of them are invisible, but there are some that I'm sure are not being caught, (laughs) are not being recognized. When that happens, there is a poor fit. When there's a poor fit, there are challenging behavioral symptoms. These are some common common secondary behavioral symptoms. So primary characteristics is that first category of behaviors. Secondary characteristics is that second category. Again, just making, um, helping us make sense of it all. Those secondary behaviors are the symptoms, the challenging behavioral symptoms. Parents never have trouble figuring these out, right? Identifying these. And this is, of course, is not an exhaustive list. These are just just a few that rise to the top. When we have a child who lags behind in so many cognitive skills that the rest of the world take for granted, don't even think about, right? They are constantly being asked to do things that they cannot do. 
It's about skill. It's not about willingness. When that happens to them all day long, that cognitive load builds and builds and builds and builds. So if you think about it as having a full tank of brain fuel when the day begins, that's if they got a good night's sleep and all of that. Let's assume they did, though. Every cognitive task takes a little bit of brain fuel from their tank because they are working harder than any other child around them just to survive their day and all of those cognitive task expectations being placed upon them, they get onto empty very quickly, right? So this is why a lot of kids who have brains that work differently and is disastrous, or maybe they make it through the day, but they come home and it's like, right? One tiny little request from the parent and they come unglued and the whole night is spent recovering, right? And the school's like, really? We don't see that. It's because they're resilient and they're holding it together all day long, but that's zapping them so quickly of that brain fuel. They don't have any when they get home, they come home on empty. It's why the accommodation for our child of giving them brain rest the day before an exciting day, like a family gathering, birthday party, whatever it might be, and giving them a day of rest afterwards is so important to help them fill their tank back up so they can go into that next day and manage the load, this cognitive load in the way that they need to. So why do these wonderful traditional parenting approaches, and I don't say that sarcastically, again, I have a neurotypical teenager who responds really well <laughs> to those traditional parenting approaches. Why don't they work with our neurodiverse kids? Well, the problem, the definition of the problem with the traditional parenting approaches are that behaviors are willful and intentional. So what can we do to just will it out of them, right? Especially when we don't know what else to do. When we are scared and feel exhausted and don't know what else to do, we reach for our power and we use that to try to do everything we can to just make that behavior stop, right? The goal is to, in that case, is to change and stop the behavior. So we use consequences, punishment, reducing choices or options, lecturing, threats, shaming, timeouts, forced isolation, physical force. The reason this clashes with our neurodiverse children is that the focus is on behavior, not on brain differences and the way their brain works. These traditional approaches require cognitive skills that our kids don't have to be effective. The consequences was the perfect example that I gave earlier. The interventions rarely consider a child's unique brain function, and it does not take into consideration the parent-child relationship, which again, we're not getting into today, but that cycle of co-regulation, providing our child who has a fragile nervous system with co-regulation, huge in, our, in this parenting paradigm, rarely, rarely talked about. So again, what can we do? Accommodations are the treatment. There's a list of accommodations here. Um, I'm not going to go through these um, line for line. Hopefully you'll have copies of this slide. If not, um, I can certainly get it out to folks in the way that works for the conference organizers so that you can go through these questions as you're trying to figure out what accommodations would work for my child in this situation. Importance of observation so that we can start to see patterns, right? And we can start to intervene proactively instead of after the fact. If you're in the middle of a challenging episode, that's not the time like, oh, Okay, what accommodation do I need here? That's not the time. <laughs> it's too late, right? But that evening, if you take a moment to reflect, like, what happened? Why was today so challenging? And start to see the patterns. There are always patterns. Then you can proactively plan, put in place accommodations for when that inevitably happens again. And then adjusting expectations. I've mentioned this a few times. Adjusting expectations is not giving in. It is about us as parents making thoughtful decisions about what expectations need to be set aside for now so that we can let the temperature in our home settle, we can help our child settle. And I know that some of you might be thinking, I ask so little of my child already, and I get that. And also, it's worth reevaluating this. Sometimes we have to really get down to the bone, bare basics of expectations for our kids. Um, and it doesn't mean so that they can settle, those challenging behavioral symptoms can settle. 
And once we have a period of stability, slowly start adding in those other expectations that are in line with their cognitive skills, right? I know what that can feel like to do like, oh my gosh, I'm not expecting anything of them. And also it's only temporary, it's not forever, okay? So the sounds of thinking from a behavioral lens and then the sounds of thinking from a brain first lens, right? If you've ever had these thoughts, these behavioral lens thoughts, um, no shame, no blame, right? And we all slip into a behavioral lens here and there. I even do it every day. <laughs> Maybe not every day, but definitely every week. I will have these thoughts of like, oh, she's doing this to me just to aggravate me, right? Because I'm human and these challenging behavioral symptoms can be just that very challenging. The work is not to be perfect. It's impossible. The work is to, when you start to hear yourself, start to think those things, understand, have that be kind of a red flag for yourself. Like, oh. I'm slipping into a behavioral lens. What do I have to do to take this step back and start to see my child through this brain first lens? What if this is about their brain working differently? What would I do differently? What can my next move on that path towards empathy, compassion, understanding, accommodations be versus down this behavioral lens that will lead to a dead end, right? So it's not a good use of your precious energy. So giving more time, these are just some quick accommodations, right? Giving more time and then more time and then more time. Using fewer words. Usually verbal input is very aggravating um, for our kids. Focus on relationship, right? Connection before correction. Assuming brain function is play, even when everything in your being is saying, oh, no, this is on purpose. Just imagine what it might be. To like to assume that it's brain first and what would you do next, right? I promise you will not lose your parental authority in that one interaction. Uh, use mantras to slow down your visceral reaction. They would do better if they could, things like that. Get support from other parents who are also working from this lens, right? Not a behavioral lens, from this lens and give yourself loads and loads of self-compassion and grace. What you're doing is incredibly difficult I understand that intimately, and you are doing an amazing job, okay? It is as hard as you think it is, and also you're capable, okay? You're not alone by any stretch. All right, I wanted to offer this, um, that on my uh, website, there's a ton of blog posts about all of these different cognitive skills, about the parent experience. Um, there's free resources there. There's also a podcast series that I made focused on this model. It's six episodes. If you want to dive even deeper into it, um, I would encourage you to check that out too. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. That was great. So um, we're not going to take questions right now because I have really uh, exciting news. First of all, her Brain First podcast is really great. If you have not listened to this, you should go there now. Um, but we also plan to invite Eileen back very soon to do a series. She did do a series with our good friends at Gervais Syndrome Foundation. And this may be news to you, Eileen, uh, that we're going to invite you back. But we want to invite her back to do a virtual series I'm with happy us. happy to hear it along with everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> to do a virtual series on these behaviors. Um, you know, it's a multi-hour program. If you do have any questions for Eileen right now, you can email them to info at lgsfoundation.org and we will get them to Eileen and hopefully you will answer them for us. Again, surprise. Absolutely. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Um, and let's give her another round of applause for that great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.